the NFA. Yeah, there's a little voice. So, Sarah, welcome to Cinema, Life and Everything. How are you today? Really good, thank you. Life is good today. Get Brilliant. to do this podcast with you and then I'm off to Manchester. A busy day, a full day then. I'm so very happy about that. Oh. <laughs> and it's going to snow in Manchester tomorrow, so I'm probably going to get snowed into Manchester. So oh. um, that's good. That makes me happy. You like snow? You're a fan of the snow, then? No, I just want to get stuck in Manchester. So <laughs> I have to leave there. To be honest, I, I, I like Manchester. I could feel, I, oh, I could really? think of worse places to be stuck in. To be quite honest, I do a lot of acting classes there now. It's a lovely place. Really developed. I love it. My my ambition in life is to become an honorary. Mancunian if someone's handing out those awards I'll take one <laughs> <laughs> lofty goals right but we're we're not here to talk about Manchester as much as I'd love to we're here to talk about films and you've got an amazing like three choices that are coming up soon one of which I'd never seen before but before we get on to them would you just like to tell the viewers or the listeners a little bit about yourself the trickiest question of all normally it's like tell us your whole life story go <laughs> So hello viewers, I'm Sarah Michelle, um, I'm from the Midlands, um, I'm a writer, director and producer, um, I've got my own production company called Glamrock Films, um, I'm new to the film industry, I changed my career in the pandemic, although I'd done a documentary making course years ago, um, I'd never quite got around to it, but I'd always kind of worked in the arts and from a musical family, um, so the pandemic was good for me because it was the opportunity to have that career change and I've never looked back looked back. It's it's been incredible. We've been through some hard times. Um pandemic, cost of living crisis and sag after. It's not the most <laughs> ideal time to bring into the film industry. It's definitely presented itself with some challenges, but actually that's quite a good thing because it is a lot about rejection and I think that that's probably given me a good thick skin to begin um so predominantly work within the film industry within the musical industry doing music videos documentaries and promos for artists and DJs um but you know I'm ambitious and I would one day like to to work in feature film as well thriller is my genre which is weird because there's no thrillers in my selections today <laughs> um I think you can't choose a favourite child. So I just went away from them all together. Uh, but yeah, so I'm working on some scripts and things for that at the moment. And um, yeah, I mean, I guess that's a little introduction to me. That's tremendous. So th there's two ways, like, there's two big questions I would like there uh, to ask. One, why do you feel, and it was for quite a few people as well, why do you feel that the uh, the lockdown, the pandemic was such a catalyst for change? For you what 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 did it that because there were some people you know it was similar for me actually I decided to go become a full-time actor just before lockdown happened so it wasn't like a greatest timing but what what was the catalyst there do you feel that was it this time for self-reflection or what happened if it's not too personal yeah so that no go deep I'm good with that <laughs> so there's a couple there's a couple of things that just <laughs> there's a couple of things that spring to mind straight away uh one being just that stillness I'm I'm not someone who's ever still um <laughs> with, yeah. like, I've got ADHD so um I'm never still I'm always <laughs> jumping from the next thing to the next thing and I had I had no choice but to just be still so I was able to think about what would I really like mm. to do with my life this is just like I've got a chance here to make a change um so that was probably sort of like the inception of the idea that it was a possibility so what I did is I I did it in a, a slightly different way and and used my time to go back to university and study so I kind of had that cushion in of being in an institution to do it because I've got more children as well so I still have bills to pay and stuff um and then the other side of it was like you know that all that time to sort of watch because we were stuck in the house I was watching a lot more mm. but for that first couple of months what I was watching a lot more of was was dying like I was watching numbers of people dying on the telly and that became quite normal to us didn't it and so you know that kind of on one hand it makes you think wow 
life's too short all these people have lost their lives right now so so that kind of hits home with you like life is really too short you know if you want to do something just do it Mm. um but on the flip side of that I found it really uninspiring just watching charts of numbers and I was like I need to make something you know I need to make something that's got some warmth um and I need to tell the story you know all these people that lost their lives all we knew is that they had died in a in a most horrific way we didn't know their stories some of them but not many um I was like we need to tell more stories about humans because those people's stories might never get told so yeah I would say that was my kind of basis for making the jump that that's such an amazing statement to make as well because it really is do you want to make life happen to you or do you let life happen to you do you i i i I think there is that like the the at that time the death count becoming the modern day plague bell where everyone was just and it can lock you into that internal mindset of where you're not really being mindful or being you're just locked into almost a depression loop or a grief loop where you've become so closed off you can't experience other people's stories there's no empathy anymore it's just living in a point of lack and fear and withdrawing whereas you chose to even though there probably was that fear there there was that locked in feeling you chose to go back what can i do here what can i reach out who can i you know, use my creative outlets to let other people understand about other people, to connect people. It's a tremendously altruistic thing to do and a really interesting mindset to have how some people went one way and some people went the other. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I just think, you know, it's like not to sound too corny, but it's a gift, you know, not everyone has that ability to think of ideas and to, play stories I mean I, you know I've been playing films in my head as long as I've got memory I can never remember not creating stories in my head and mm. if you have that there it's a gift it is a gift so um and there's and there's other people who have these incredible lives and stories to tell um real and fictional and um maybe they don't have a voice to tell them so yeah I think it's important if you get it's that you know you hear people talk all the time about burning desire and I think it is that (laughs) I I, I do think it has to be as well because you mentioned earlier on about the rejection and I, I was thinking I know the work situation has changed a little bit now but I remember being employed and really how many job interviews you'd go for and how many rejections you'd get depending and then if you're seeking funding or if you're applying for acting positions how many if you're you know if you're regular how many like self-tape refusals and stuff you get in a week and almost you know that becomes normal like you just get used to the rejection because you're like oh well so it sort of toughens you up in another way yeah absolutely and I always tell people that I work with I'm I'm forever the optimist anyway but I mm. always say to people that I work with now I work on a 90 10 if you prepare yourself to get a 90 percent rejection which is about <laughs> right yeah 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 if you're working at a 10 percent success rate then you kind of take a little bit of the disappointment out of it yes. um and another thing like I, I guess you watch the um the Hollywood roundtables as well. I always remember uh-huh. this one where Robert De Niro was talking about it. Yeah, they're amazing, aren't they? Um, and Robert De Niro was like, don't, you know, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Like have lots of irons in the fire so that yes. you're not, because it's like desperation, isn't it? Um, you can relate it to sort of other areas of your life, like dating, for example, you know, like, oh, if, you, if you're kind <laughs> of like holding on to something so tight, it yes. reeks of desperation. And then who wants that, you know? Um, so I, any one time for the last three years that I've been doing this, I've always got kind of at least five or six things going on at once and something will stick, you know? The yeah. most important thing for me, the thing that I say to myself every single day is, just stay in the race just never give up if you stay in the race you will get there you know um and I've watched so many in my little three years I've watched so many people give up and what's not to say that their next thing could have been the thing that that got them the recognition I, I think as well 
one thing that's really sort of like allowed me to gel as well, and I don't know if you agree about this, it's like you start to find pleasure in the small things. There's the famous Brian Cranston speech where he talks about your work is to do the audition. It's not to book the job, it's the audition and having that opportunity to play the character. I remember Michael Keaton said a very similar thing as well. And it teaches you to be a lot more and be mindful. And if you're going to stay in it, to find those small pleasures, to find the victories in the everyday, as opposed to always setting your sight on this unachievable goal being no where am i right now i remember you saying this yesterday sorry listeners and, and watchers you didn't hear this one but sarah come up with an amazing point that i always really vibe with as well was the thing of just being sometimes if you just allow stop chasing so much and this i think refers to, i don't know my case refers to dating anyway if you just allow and be in a moment take <laughs> care of the present moment then the future almost takes care of itself be consistent in your efforts in the day now and then the things come to you be who you want to be now yeah absolutely and like you and I talk a lot about stillness because obviously that's a big part of acting and directing that people don't necessarily Hard think about ADHD. And sometimes you really have <laughs> I know <laughs> like, yeah. how'd you do that then like, that's probably one of the biggest challenges but actually maybe maybe because of that maybe we get more out of it because mm -hmm. it's such a rare thing for us and maybe that's our biggest challenge do you know what I mean and <laughs> and that's great because because if you yeah if you're having to just kind of rebel against your own mind to do something and you're really testing yourself and I think that's when good things happen yes um yeah and, and last year I had a particularly I mean, I didn't stop working last year. I had like crazy burnout. I was, mm. it was insane what I did last year. And I kept just saying to myself, but next year I'm going to just be still. And, you know, we're only a month in and just little things are starting to come through that were the seeds that were planted last year. So it's tried and tested. It does work. Um, and yeah, so yesterday I just had that day where I just, I was like, oh, I need to do this, I need to do this. I was like, I'm going to just try try and do nothing for today. And yeah, things happen. So there's a lot to be said for that, I think. The manifesting um, universe in action. Exactly. Definitely. Definitely. Um, and it, yeah, I think, I think hope is good you know yeah. if you hope and the thing is you can't be hopeful if you if you're always doing and grinding you're not giving yourself headspace to be hopeful and what if and I wish and you know that kind of it's almost like magic it's quite childlike do you know what I mean and 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 that's it as well that is wow magic is such a good way of putting it as well because for me it's sort of like it's not really in da -da -da moment. It's in the anticipation before it happens. That's where the excitement is. That's where the emotion mm -hmm. is. So it's like understanding that, you know, you're on your journey. These things are going to happen. The drum rolls going or the magicians reaching into the hat. It's not always about seeing the bunny because then it's over. It's building and accepting that the magic will happen. Yeah, hundred percent. Uh, when I when I was tra working traveling the world, we went to the pyramids. When you could still go inside the pyramids, oh, and we were wow. on this three-hour awful coach journey. But I can just remember being so excited. In my head, the pyramids were paved with gold, you know. <laughs> and of course, when we got there, you you stand at the pyramids and you look that way, and there's the desert. You look that way, and there's Rubbish. Pizza Hut. <laughs> and when you go inside the pyramids well you can't you can't go inside the pyramids anymore you're not allowed anymore but when you go inside you're nearly having a panic attack from how claustrophobic it is mm. um but for that three hours on that bus journey the pyramids were paved with gold for me and that's that's optimism that's hope and and you're born with that my kids have it so if you can keep a little bit of that it will serve you well, I think. It what it's what drives us all. What a beautiful way of putting it. I think everything can be paved with gold if you believe in it. You know, that's it. And it's not toxic pos positivity. Mm -hmm. It's not mindless optimism. It's choosing the lens you view your life with. You can review. You can view your life as constantly depressed and broken down and never celebrating anything and being self-critical. It's the same life. It's just if you choose to view it with hope and joy and gratitude 
you're getting the same life, but it's just a, a much better existence. <laughs> A hundred percent. And I think it's not toxic positivity if it's internal. You, like the, if you let the exterior factors, people and events af affect you and you hang your positivity onto a promise of someone else or a job or whatever it is. But if it's internal, you've got full control about it and, and, and it creates good feelings. So how can that be toxic? That's probably more healing than it is toxic, you know. Absolutely, absolutely perfect. Well, we could talk. This is so, so such so nice to hear a like mind as well. But we got to talk about films. We got to talk about three <laughs> amazing films. So, would yeah. you like to tell everyone your three favorite films today? And we can start wherever. So, obviously, being ADHD, uh, how could I possibly? It took me about five days to choose my three favorite films. That's good. Five days is category. good. <laughs> I had to categorize them yeah yeah probably a bit more thinking but yeah. i was like right if i just choose the category then i can like streamline them down mm. so the three films that i've chosen are all road trip movies and they're all music movies and both of those things are intrinsically linked to me as a person and the way i live my life music and, and travel are hu two huge parts of who i am Amazing. so the three films are thelma and louise yep Most famous and mystify the Michael Hutchin documentary. Three incredible choices. Two, Thelma and Louise and Almost Famous, I absolutely adore. But Mr. Fire, you switched me on to, got to watch it over the weekend and absolutely blew me away. So I, I sense there may be an order here. Which, which one would you like to start with? I don't know. Yeah, let's go Thelma and Louise first. Oh. And probably that's the, one that, that's the one that I saw first. So let's start big, shall we? Da, da, uh, let's yeah, start it, big. It doesn't now, get there much was actually big or two... more perfect. <laughs> That's good. We'll start here because we've probably got the most to say about this one. But um, first of all, Thelma and Louise was not the only Tony Scott film in my top in my top three. True Ram True Romance kept going in and coming out, and Ooh. it was really oh, and and there'll be friends and family watching this who know me who were like how is true romance not in <laughs> that is kind of you know through my life my favorite film um but when I'm thinking about the film and I'm thinking about me mm. um Thamara and Louise I watched it I watched it when I was probably too young to be honest I think I was 11 when it came out so I watched it at quite a young age and wow what an impact that film has on my life because wow. all, all of a sudden I mean obviously I'm coming to a career in film late but I loved film from the day I was born, you know, and mm. um, those two women, those two women in those roles showed me the power of art um, and the power of women very, very early on in my life. Those performances mm. that I sometimes I still can't believe that those two actresses are real people that are walking this earth. I'm like, no, they died. They're yeah. dead. <laughs> They're in the bottom of the Grand Canyon, you know. Um, when you talk about with again ADHD I'm not going to keep talking about it but it's, endings are difficult for, to get to the end of something is very difficult for me um so I need like you know gratification that I've stayed with something to the end and it is probably one of my favorite if not my favorite film endings of all time yeah the part I the part I love most about it actually is Harvey Keitel's reaction. Hey, yeah. You know, just that moment is like, he re he really wanted to save those women, you know. Um, obviously, we're spoiling this for everyone who hasn't seen hey, You should have watched it. <laughs> if you haven't seen Samra and Louise. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, just, I have so much empathy in my heart for him. Because I kind of feel... For Thelma and Louise, they sometimes hope is hopeless, right? Mm. But they were so hopeful. Like they had, they were like, this is the right thing to do. They were happy with their decision, right? But Harvey Keitel's character, he, his heart is broken in two because he really thought he was going to save those women. And he's not he's not in that film a lot, but his role is very, very impactful because 
those women have been scorned by men, but here is a man who has nothing but pure empathy for these two characters. And that is so clever. So clever. Seeing a police officer whose typical role in these sort of films is trying to bring the bad guys down, whereas he knows how he's seen this story before. He knows how this is going to go and he's doing it, like you mentioned, doing everything in his power, trying to stop the sad ending. And it's, it, yeah, it's just, it's such an original film. I, you know, not even at that time having two female leads like that. Uh, the way men are just supporting characters and what a supporting cast as well. Michael Madsen, arguably never better. The uh, uh, Someone, yeah. Mr. Pitt, Brad Pitt, may have heard of him. He's probably his <laughs> he's like first sort of like big role. And it's just it's just perfectly done. It, it's it's it, the desert is as much of a character as everything. Like you say, the soundtrack in it is absolutely perfect. The characterization, the acting from beginning to end is perfect it's just it's it's a flawless film an absolutely flawless film mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, the pacing the pacing of the film is something that i love the pacing is absolutely perfect because we we know that there's there's something deeper going on as to why she shot this guy you know mm -hmm. it's it's too much of a shocking re revelation for this character who who is kind of so stiff up her lips. I love actually what, what they did with them, um, hair, makeup and costume within this film. You know, at the beginning of the film, her hair's like all tightly pulled back into a French braid, her collar's up here. She's, you know, washing her cup and drying it and putting it on the side, just pure perfection as a human being, you know. And as the film slowly goes on, her hair starts to fall out to the end where she's got a bandana. And I just love that because that really like visually takes you on this journey with that character. And you did not see, I mean, at the time, Sam and Louise was, was called an action film and, you know, Tony yeah. Scott's an action director. And there is a lot about that film that is action, but it has, it, it has a lot more of that. It's got a very dramatic heart to it as well. And I think if you watch it with that mindset, it's very, very clever how they've used those visual aids to unravel the characters. Um, so it's, it's almost like hidden in plain sight. And I think that's really clever. Like there's, there's reasons why she's so uptight and, and, and killing someone mm. allows her to let her guard down. It's absolutely crazy. If it happened in the real world, it would be on the news. But when you watch it in a film, you can really relate to that. You really can. I, I, I just think it's... I, I do remember the original trailer and much was made over the bit where they blow the truck up to give it that action sort of sheen. So I think it was trying to get people into the cinema via stealth, like, oh, this thing's blowing up and car chases. And and it, it wasn't that at all. It was such a wonderful commentary on really the injustice in between the sexes and a, a literal hero's journey of two women and how they realize themselves yeah. fully and for me yeah it's a tragic ending but it's still they're unapologetic and unsubservient they've chose they even though it's a tragic end it was their own choice they were they they were they they faced the final sort of foe in a way, which was the patriarchy and chose not to fold to it. And I think it's an absolutely, it's a, it's an amazing, I mean, not death, but it's an amazing message of empowerment. Absolutely. Yeah. They're not dead. They're not dead at all. Um, not. And another, another factor just to add on to that is <laughs> another factor to add on to that is something that you and I were talking about yesterday on the phone. Um, God. I mean, this is what it is. This life imitating art. The way that Tony Scott chose his death, we, we can only assume that he chose it because he's mm. not here to tell us. But he went off a bridge. He went off a bridge, yeah. and you can't. You kind of have to think about that. What it, when you watch that film again now, you're like, well, oh my gosh! Like the the director of this film actually died by leaving his car and going off a bridge you know um mm. we we can't we can't comment from his point on that but but there's there's definitely something to be said about the power of creation there affecting who you are as a human being and don't you feel as well i'd love to talk to you about this that even 
a director, even if you're directing someone else's script, I mean, ultimately, I think we could get into a big thing about the 70s when everyone was like a director, script writer, editor, all in one, how that's been changed. But I, I think an interesting mm -hmm. question to pose to you would be mm -hmm. how you feel like, even if you're using someone else's script, even if it's someone else's vision, as an actor, reading someone else's script, being directed by someone, you always leave an imprint of self. There has to be something you find in the work if you're not that that is true to you. I mean, ultimately, even if you're creating yourself and you're talking about other characters that aren't you, they may be an avatar or a cipher in some way to get the message, to get a meaning, to get a thought that is true to you out into a larger conversation and consciousness. It's the only way to do it because it makes it human. There's something yes. of me in every single character that I write, create, direct. Um, um, and it might just be a glimpse or it might be a phrase or it might be an action or it might be an event, okay? But but if you don't allow those things to envelope into the, into the finished piece, then you're deliberately stopping a natural flow. And when you, and you see it, in television and film you can tell when somebody has kind of gone oh I'm just going to come out of myself completely for a minute and try and talk like this person it doesn't work yes you have to find a way of taking your own life experience and your own mental state and channel it into those characters um and I think with Thelma and Louise that has been done so well because you've got you've got a male and female writer director working together so you've got both sides of the coin there and for its time I think they did it incredibly I'm sure there's a lot of people that would agree with me because there's still scenes of rape and you know I don't I wouldn't put a rape scene in any of my films I'd just allude to it but this is 30 years ago all the time they they did that incredibly and that is because they allowed natural aspects of their own selves to go to go into their work I, I think that's a perfect way of putting it as well and, and not having that fear of being seen I, I I think as an actor um I, I think when I collaborate with directors and stuff as well, it's having that trust, trust with the other people you're working with, and also a trust that the audience will respect the authenticity. Because we spoke about this the other day as well, about even though it's theatrical, even though it's a performance, it's all about the authentic self. It's about talk, talking from a place that you feel inside yourself that is true and seeking uh, an echo or seeking a reciprocation or an understanding for whoever's viewing it, that they will take that information on board in any which way they need to and offer something back as well. Yeah, absolutely. That that actually bridges us nicely into the, if we talk about mystify next, because what we were talking about yesterday is that fiction can feel so real and documentary um, it can feel so manufactured. And somebody said to me at the very, very beginning of my filmmaking journey, <clears throat> somebody said to me, okay, right, you need to decide now. Are you gonna are you gonna create fiction or documentary? You need to choose a path and follow it. And I was like, no, <laughs> I wanna do both. Good. <laughs> and I will do both. I mean rule breaker rebel like i'm gonna do both and sometimes i'm gonna mix them together Brilliant. you know i'm gonna make documents why not that have theatrical dramatization yeah and so there's always that question um so the reason i chose to put a documentary in my top three was one to highlight that point that the two cross over um, at times when you're watching Mystify, and I'm sure there's loads of people who are going to watch this it's amazing. who haven't seen it. So I'm going to try and not give too much away. I'm going to try and not give too much away because you do get that wow moment when you when you when you find out the twist about his life. Mm. Now I'm saying that as if it's a fiction film, but this was his life. And there's something about Michael Hutchins that you don't know unless you watch this film mm. something gets revealed about who, who he was and something that happened to him to completely change the pathway of his life um, mm. really really controversial character you know in the press for the whole of my oh. teenage years um, 
wasn't he? It's, it's, it yes, was a... you know, all... Sorry, I don't interrupt. <laughs> oh, that's okay. Yeah, he was um he was he was really sort of hounded, hounded by the best. Well, it was that thing of build him up, you know, people telling it it's a new Jim Morrison, he looked like Jesus, you know, yeah. he was built up into this absolute rock god, yeah. rock god, and then tore down. I mean, I you know, I worked in music before I worked in film. And I managed indie bands for years. That was part of what I did. And um, that community absolutely hated him. They mm. hated him, like, to a point where I was like, this is completely irrational, this hatred for this person. They don't know him. Um, the mo they don't know him. Um, but, the, but the way he was painted by the media, I, I think, you know, potentially one of the most misunderstood artists of, of, our, of our time. Mm -hmm. um, and um, the 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 brilliant thing about how and I went I went to watch this documentary on my own in the cinema. It was one of those um, one off show ins when they do a Q and A with the director and everything oh. at the end. Um, um, Michael H Michael Hutchins' daughter had actually um, allowed for all of the footage to be accessed. Wow. Um, and then two two of his famous exes, um, notably Kylie Minogue and Helena Christiansen, mm. but openly talked about very personal stuff, which is not unprecedented, but you don't see it very much. Not from now. No. In in sort of biographical documentaries, they those three human beings felt so strongly about having version of him told in in a more authentic light and and that is so powerful and this series of things that happened to him in in the mid to late 90s leading up into his death mm. effectively changed who he was as a person and I feel like maybe we should I don't know what do you think should we talk about that or not I, I I think, listen, if you haven't seen it, balls of podcast, go watch it, come back. I think we do sort of have to like, <laughs> talk to it a little bit. But yeah, I, I mean, yeah, it, it was just, yeah, like you say, the, uh, sorry, you talk first of all, because I'm really interested in where you're going with this. Well, I, I kind of, you know, when, when he died and when it was like, oh, he died playing a sex game and he was, you know, it's scandalous and, you know, broken up this marriage yeah. with from Paulie Yates to Bob Geldof. And there is some truth in that. You know, we can't deny that. No. Um, but he was just really painted as this absolutely, you know, ter terrible human being that was just so reckless that he died playing a sex game. And of course it wasn't true. No. Uh, you know, what actually, what actually happened is that the, six years prior to his death um and we see this documented a lot now I, you'll know more than me what it's called but it's CTE, the, the one trauma. punch kill yes right? yeah 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 so so this has been documented a lot now um and and there have been court cases haven't there where someone has been killed from one punch and a lot and they've had a lesser sentence because it's yeah um you know, so he was sitting on his motorbike eating a pizza and a taxi driver got road raid, punched him in the face. He, his head hit the pavement. Blood was coming out of his nose and his ears. Um, when he came round, he was a different person. Mm. It changed his life. Um, his brain, but he wouldn't stay in hospital and get the treatment he needed to get when he eventually got the treatment because he was quite aggressive. That was one of the things that it done. Brain damage, you know, when he finally got the treatment that he needed, it was discovered that he'd lost all of his sense of smell and all of his sense of taste. I mean, imagine losing two of your senses. You know, he was told if you had to have a newborn baby, you'll never be able to smell your newborn baby. Wow. And the thing is, as well, what you're talking about, the one punch kill, I, I know through like reading a lot of stuff through concussions and how concussions are more like a slow wearing down on the brain. Whereas if you get unfortunately hit in the perfect spot, it doesn't it might not kill you, but it sort of kills who you are. It takes a lot of your emotions. It jumbles up 
a lot of signals. It will make you, like you say, a much more aggressive and moody person as well, because the brain is basically trying to rewire and reconfigure sensation and emotion. Now, take into the fact as well, like you say, basically two of your major senses of pleasure are suddenly dead. It's it's going to make your brain go absolute into chaos and catastrophe. Yeah, absolutely. And for somebody who is an artist, I mean, we rely on our senses. That's our output. Um, yes. We we have to we have to see and hear and feel and smell the stories and te you know like that 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 is part and that's a huge part of who he was, um, and he had that taken away from him and because he chose maybe not you know not not in his not fully in his right mind you know because of what had happened because of his brain damage he chose to to not tell everyone and he made his girlfriend at the time who was you know also hugely famous in her own right you are not allowed I, you've got to promise mm. me you will never tell anyone you will Amazing. never tell so of course to the outside world all of a sudden it's, he's this arrogant rock guard and yeah. he's this and he's that no he was really really seriously ill you know he had brain damage and I just remember sitting in the cinema with my popcorn on my own like because I always kind of had this thing like I wanted to protect him you know like when someone's getting bullied at school I really yes. was like I don't like the way that people are treating him all throughout my life and then this film came out in 2019 and this is why I've chose it because I was just like wow that's why yes. and it's kind of justice through storytelling in film and I'm like that is why we do it because he he's been gone for so long now yeah. but finally anybody who takes the time to open-mindedly watch this film will understand that that is not who he was so we were just talking about like, yes, the absolute yeah. devastation that Michael Hutchins had to face. And even though it's a um, a documentary, so it's real footage, um, it's not been, it, there was such a horror film like uh, aspect to it, really similar to when I tried to watch the Amy um, autobiography as well, which now they've sort of done a theatrical thing called Back to Black. And it, it sort of strikes me quite strange that, like, you know, they say the truth is always stranger than fiction. I think with this documentary, especially Mystify, whether it's real footage or not, there, there is such an overwhelming sense of emotion. You're not questioning it anymore, how it's been altered, like the video and like what they were allowed to show, the personal nature of him with Kylie, him with Helena, um, him with his family. You just get such a, tr like, a true sense of this of this man and what a beautiful soul he was but then you link it back to the time which i remember when he was a marriage wrecker and he was um getting the kids hooked on drugs and you know he corrupted kylie minogue and all of these things and it's like it's such a terrible thing that when you get that level of fame that the narrative of yourself is being controlled anywhere you walk they see you in a certain way and especially at that time if it was decided you were evil, then that's the only narrative that was told about you. There's no, and to be honest, I, I'd be naive to say it isn't like that today. Maybe not even more so how people can be cancelled or just destroyed if it's due, if it's their time. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and I think it's something to be wary of, you know, not on the scale of Michael Hutchins at all, but in your own small circles with working in the creative arts, when, when you are putting a part of yourself out there all the time, you are being judged mm. um, in rooms. You are being spoken about in rooms that you're not in, um, in good and bad ways. Um, and all of us, all of us have and will continue to encounter that. Um, but it's about holding on to who you truly are. Um, yes. And I think this film went some way towards shifting the narrative back in favour of Michael Hutchin 100%. and that is the power of film and uh, and that was necessary um and so one, yeah, one thing um, I do want to sorry one thing I did want to say quickly for anybody listening to this right um Sarah recommended this to me I loved in excess I, I, I'm a big fan of in excess actually but I was aware of when he started to get painted as this very dark figure um 
I would say even if you didn't know his story, it's such an important documentary to watch, not just for the music, just to hear someone's true life and it told in an unbiased and responsible way. There is some bad points in there, but it's it's one of the best documentaries I've ever seen about bringing out a complete story and a complete reflection of how what a per, what a person he was. So and the music and the level of emotion in it and how much they get through in such a short amount of time and it doesn't feel like anything's being missed out. It's an absolutely phenomenal film and I can't believe it slipped under my radar. So whoever listens to this, don't let it slip under your radar. Really go out of your way to watch this one. It's absolutely astonishing. Sexy, beautiful, poignant, really emotional, really incredibly sad at points as well. A beautiful film. And beautifully put, you've said it all there. <laughs> right. Well, you did, it. You, you yeah, did it. I agree you, with everything you just said. <laughs> you did an amazing segue into Mystify. So if we're going to talk about rock star journeys, let's talk about Almost Famous. Yeah. <laughs> you did it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Okay. So this might, might be a case of save the best for last in some ways. Almost Famous for me is the it, it's who I like this film is I am this film personified like <laughs> there are so many intricacies and coincidences in this film that I'm like was Cameron Crowe like buying on like honestly it's, <laughs> it's insane how how this film I and and so this this film for me is like a little blanket of warmth or a best friend like an old friend because I was I was 20 when this film came out wow. um and I'd already started working in the music industry and um I'm from a music industry family just to give you a bit of background um of, of rock musicians. Um, my uncle is an incredible uh, session musician, rock guitarist who's played with some huge artists from the 70s. His son is a drummer that's still out drumming now with, wow. with rock bands from the 80s. My dad was in a band called Acid. Apparently it's just, you know, what, what everyone was into at the time. <laughs> um, so I um, my <laughs> Yeah. And then um, my godfather, my dad's best friend, his uncle is a huge rock musician. I'm not going to get all name droppy, but I was basically, this is not, this is a true story. I was conceived in a rock star flat at a rock and roll party. Oh, where, come on. I mean, amazing. God knows what was going on. But then, <laughs> they'll tell me off the name dropping. But, um, you know, but, Someone who was in a band with a beetle, I'll say that much. Um, <laughs> so I literally, I had, I had the audacity to be born into a world where it was like, rock, it, I was literally born into rock and roll, you know. Amazing. Um, so it was kind of just always the way for me. I was never going to do anything else. And you couldn't. As soon as I became a teenager, I was a rebel. You know, it's just, well, this is who I am. It's rock and roll, man. You know, this is, I was born into it. And I've told myself this narrative my whole life. And and there's some truth in it. And then when I get to 20 years old, after I've had my teenage rebellious years, I'm already working in the music industry as a DJ at this time. Um, this film comes out. Um, and um, I would say my, my life narrative up until sort of the age of, 30 I am I'm a cross between uh, William who who is um created as a fictional character but this film is semi-autobiographical story of Cameron Crowe now people might not know who Cameron Crowe is from his name but from his work he will because he's made some of the most incredible films of all time unbelievable fast times at Ridgemont High Jerry Maguire you know I'm, I'm I won't get into the others but I adore him as a writer he he writes dialogue like like no one else. I'll, I'll get onto that though because I'm jumping now. But but basically, this film came out, um, and I was like, oh, I feel like this is a little bit of my life. And and then three years after this film came out, 
I started managing indie bands and I lived a version, a, a 2000s version of this 1970s period piece where I was on the road with bands, sleeping in, you know, sleeping on floors and in buses and stuff. Um, and um, this film is a, it's a road trip trip movie it's it's a it's a music movie it's a friendship movie Mm. it's a first love movie it just like it just fills me with warmth that I could talk about this film all day I have so much affection I am in love with this film it's 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 perfect and I watched it again simply when you said it was going to be one of your films because I do love it so much it's it's perfection. I, I, the, you name Cameron Crowe films. I'm, uh, I'm going to give a little shout out for his, um, his remake of Vanilla Sky, which I, I really liked. I know it was absolutely bombed on release, but I, I thought it was amazing. Thought one of Tom Cruise's best roles. But um, I, what I want to say is that I... his musical choice is incredible. Sorry, sorry, you were going to say. I loved Vanilla Sky. I, I loved always, it too. I thought it was brilliant. But I, I, I just think he. Taylor Cameron Crow authors his film so well. Again, we were talking earlier on about his complete a completeness of vision that with a director, you get this idea that what they wanted, the questions they wanted to ask has ended up on screen exactly as they intended. And I think that's coming back again a lot more now with A24. A few films I've seen recently, like All of Us Strangers, Past Lives. And anyway, that's a whole other story. But one thing I'd really want to get across to you is like the trueness of your art, um, rock and roll. And then you've got a film about rock and roll. And then you've got a semi autobiographical uh, film about rock and roll. So you're combining all these things together. But ultimately, the importance of art to question, to rebel, not just to accept, not not to just commit chaotic acts for the sake of it, but to be able to have the freedom to question and choose your own unique path rather than just accept. Yeah, absolutely, definitely. Um, and there's there's some complexities in all of the characters. All of the characters are slightly different, and we're very used to being sold that idea of a band has the crazy one, the the deep thinker, the wild, you know. Um, and those characters are painted through the musicians. Um, and uh, Penny Lane's character, who's played by Kate Hudson, and despite the fact that this film does get doesn't get as much recognition as it is it should i think she was nominated for best actress yeah. um in this role and um it's um yeah you you kind of like sit musical differences is the is the reason given for most bands and artists breaking up and parting ways um and this film depicts that so well yeah. because you've got ego you've got creativity you've got being away from home um, you've got access to as much sex, drugs, and rock and roll as you like, and when you put all those things in the melting pot, yeah, it's pretty chaotic. Um, and and I I have had so many little m- moments and incidents in my life in the music industry that he, you can tell it's authentic, you can tell it's his story because I've seen those things happen, those similar arguments, those similar altercations. Um, the crazy nights and everything. Um, what the most beautiful scene in this film for me, though, which most people will probably agree, is the tiny dancer oh. scene when they've had a wild night out, um, done loads of things that they regret, and then they're back on the bus to the next destination to do it all again but they've all fallen out they're not talking everyone's quiet there's a bit of paranoia in the air from all the excess what have i done Um, (laughs) tiny dancers starts playing yeah exactly we you know i think probably most people can relate to that in some respect and and that's (laughs) and that's uh, (laughs) you'll definitely see a bit of that in my scripts over the years (laughs) but um that's so (laughs) <laughs> that song plays out and it's just a message of how art but more specifically music unites us one person starts singing the next starts singing and, and by the end of the song they're all friends again they're all in love again all is forgotten and off they go to start it again and isn't that life you know and it and it's like that Cameron Crow thing, and it almost brings it. I can see why you chose this as well, because just and why it lifts me as well. 
he is a positive director like there is that sense of beauty like not everything works out but finding the joy even in the heightened realization or realism of being a rock star there is the monotony of touring of like you say sleeping on a floor on a bus or something like that but finding the joy in the every day and and just being able i think cameron crow it just having that childlike wonder what an adventure we're all on be you a rock star or be you a journalist or be you know just anyone Find the joy and the adventure and the passion in your life and speak it to everyone else. Connect. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, that's if I if I didn't have those feelings, if I didn't have that childlike wonder, I think I'd move on and do something else. Yeah. Um. So even just watching that film is is probably a good reminder. If if everybody can find that film that makes them feel that way, that like, I want to make this film, I feel like I am this film, you know then you know you're doing something right and it's kind of like therapy and that's yeah. when cinema works when it's therapy right so and 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 we have to we can't talk about almost famous without mentioning philip seymour hoffman and it was 10 years last week since he died can you believe it that's insane i mean uh, uh there's so many like of his films like The Master, um, I always love Punch Drunk Love. Um, even is it Mission Impossible Three he was in? Just everything he did, Capote. I mean, I'll just start saying words in a minute, but from beginning to end, oh, oh, oh God, um, till the devil knows you're dead. He is absolutely phenomenal and absolutely un no vanity, no uh restraint, just poured all of himself into every character and it's yeah such a sad thing that such a master of his art at the same time was suffering with such depression and addiction as well but as Michael Hutchins uh, as Mystify proves we don't know the person so who knows what he was truly going for and I, I don't think you should ever judge your character as an actor and I definitely don't judge people as uh, a fellow human Absolutely. And I think as for you as an actor, for me as a writer director, um, the lessons that we can learn from those people is that, you, you know, if you do allow yourself to put your vulnerability into your work, then it will be more incredible. Whatever the cost of that is, is case by case individuals. For some people, that is too much, maybe, mm. but it gets results because, wow, you know, what he left, us is such a gift one of my favorite one of my favorite lines actually that is not from any of the films that we've talked about is philip seymour hoffman line from the film the boat that rocked and the the boat's sinking and everyone's jumping ship and he just sits on the deck and he's got these tears in his eyes that you you know that those tears are real right yeah and and then um, one of his one of his friends says to him what are you thinking and he says i'm just thinking this is as good as it's ever gonna get Ooh. wow oh that is so powerful you know yeah that, that there's when we talk about fiction and when we talk about fiction and life imitating art that's real you know oh, and it's yeah. incredible um but yeah almost famous just just a beautiful perfect perfect film in well, in every way and costumes and soundtrack as well just incredible sarah i i, I cannot thank you enough um it's been pretty much an hour now, but honestly, I feel like we could talk all day. Um, you have said so many yeah. one-liners that I got excited. And we talk about my ADHD. I'm cut off at the chest on the picture, but my feet have been doing little happy dances with so many things that you've said and, and statements <laughs> you've come out with, with your view to life and joy and passion. That's the word that keeps coming out to me about you, just having this passion for life, this passion for creativity. And it's just this rock and roll soul that just wants to keep playing its unique song. So I just want to thank you so much for your time today. And could you just let people know where people can follow you and what you've got coming up? You're so welcome. Uh, yeah, so I'm working on a couple of music documentaries at the minute. One about um, House Music Legends K Class um, and one about Lisa Lashes. Um, I'm writing a script for a, a gritty TV drama called Youth Club, um, which we should know more on that um, later in the year. 
And then I have a couple of film festival nominations for some music videos coming up shortly as well. So um, you can find out everything on my Instagram. It's um, my handle is at Sarah Michelle Glamrock. Um, and then my website is glamrockfilms.co.uk. Thank put, you so much. No worries. I will put those links in the uh, show notes as well. So if you didn't catch them there, go look at the show notes, have a click, go and have a look. Sarah, thank you so much. I'm sure we'll continue this conversation away from the podcast. <laughs> but thank you so much for your time. It's the most important thing we all have. So really appreciate you spending this time with me today. And I will uh, see you soon and speak to you soon, okay? Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye.